This is the Church of St. Paul in the Desert. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I don't know. If you're going to start something, and you're going to have a sign, remember, it doesn't say miracle, it says sign. If you're going to have a sign to kick things off, don't you want to have a really big sign? In this case, the sign of changing water to wine, to me, doesn't seem all that big, does it? Did any of you ever watch the original Saturday Night Live? Remember Father Guido Sarducci? <laughs> Father Guido Sarducci uh, was complaining because the Pope at the time, I think it was John Paul I, um, was making a bunch of saints. And he was beatifying these people from all over the globe. And there was an American saint, Mother Anne Seton. Well, Father Guido Sarducci was really upset. We've got tons of saints in Italy that are far more important than her. All she ever did was she stopped being an Episcopalian to join the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> and he said, and for saints, you've got to have miracles, three miracles. We got lots of them in Italy. She, two of hers were card tricks. <laughs> so so my, my point with this is, is that if you're going to kick things off with a big miracle or a big sign, this one's kind of really low key, isn't it? It's, it's not like healing the man born blind. It's not like feeding 5,000 people. So why do you think they started with this one? Well, first of all, Jesus has been invited along with his disciples to this celebration, this wedding feast that would perhaps go on for as much as a week. And in the course of the celebration, somebody manages to get the word out, they've run out of wine. They're out of wine. And all of a sudden, it could be that the celebration would stop. And frankly, if you've got a celebration with a bunch of people who are already half drunk, it might not just stop. It might get really bad in a hurry. And so Jesus steps in, kind of not really quite knowing exactly what, why he wants to do this, but he steps in and says, fill the jars with water. And the next thing you know, they've got the best wine they've ever tasted. The celebration continues. And in fact, that celebration still continues. Because signs, unlike miracles, aren't necessarily about what the content of the sign is. They're about where does the sign point. And this sign points to Jesus. And it points to Jesus, and it points to the kind of community that Jesus is trying to build. This is the second chapter of John's Gospel. It's the first public ministry that Jesus does besides building up his crew. And the first thing that it points to is the kind of community that Jesus wants to build. And the community that Jesus wants to build is one that is abundantly filled with joy. The community that Jesus desires to build is filled with joy. And now, in a sense, all of the scriptures that we have, I don't think they were picked for this reason, but all of the scriptures online for today also do the same thing. The reading from Isaiah. Think about this. You are called uh, desolation. What's the... Sorry. Fading memory here. All right. Yeah, you are called... You are called forsaken, but your name, the new name that the Lord will give you, is my delight is in her. Does that talk about joy and abundance. And then you've got the reading from 1 Corinthians where it starts out with this idea that no one who has the spirit of Christ will ever say Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord without the spirit. So one of the um, theologians that I was listening to this week or biblical critic, critics that I was listening to this week from Luther Seminary was saying 
essentially this is Paul telling them to back off because they've been picking at each other about who's really in and who's not in. And they're saying, if you can say Jesus is Lord, you're all in this together, so back off. Leave each other alone. Focus on the gifts because God has gifts for building up this community of abundance, this community of joy, and he has gifts that are to be distributed to everyone. Notice, Paul did not say these gifts are to be distributed to the people who dress funny on Sunday morning. He didn't say these gifts are to be distributed to the wealthy in your congregation. He said these gifts are to be distributed by the Spirit of God to everyone. Abundance, joy. It is the nature of the community that Jesus was beginning to build in the second chapter of John's Gospel and you know, one of the challenges with this, and maybe I don't know, maybe you're tired of this. Maybe you're tired of hearing about abundance and joy and everything else. But let's face it, one of the challenges we have is that if you were to ask the average person on the street, if you were to read in depth the Pew poll on people's religious affiliations and stuff, and to ask them what church is all about, what are the things that people come up with? They can give you a list of all the things that churches are against. They can give you a list of all of the um, ways that Christians look down on one another. They can talk about all the fights that even us in the Episcopal Church are having with each other. I don't think that was what was intended for the kind of PR that Jesus wanted his church to have. I think the community that Jesus was building was one that he wanted to be able to express, to proclaim, to model for all the world abundant joy. Now, the reality of our lives is that our lives are not always just chock full of joy. I remember the priest who uh, was the priest at our parish when I was growing up. He used to talk about dry-toothed Christians. And dry-toothed Christians were Christians who smiled so much that their teeth actually got dry because they are always smiling. And he kind of considered those kind of Christians were really working hard to present something they didn't actually feel. So I don't want to say that we should be dry-toothed Christians who in the face of everything are always acting just happy campers all the time. I don't think that's what joy is all about. In our congregation, we've got these three funerals this week, which in my opinion continue the joy of the life of our church. It is sad that somebody dies. It is very real that somebody dies, but their death is not the last word. God's last, God has the last word, and God's last word for us is life. And so these funerals, these memorial services, these celebrations of life, are exactly that. They are a continuation of the joy that we've known together as a part of Christ's body that we express for those who are now part of the church triumphant rather than the church militant. I think we're the church militant, aren't we? Okay, we're the church militant. It's for the church triumphant that that joy continues. And lest you think that I'm making this up myself, I want to turn back to the gospel itself. Because in this particular gospel, there's an interesting feature. Jesus' mother shows up. It says, it says that his mother was at the wedding and Jesus and the disciples were also invited. The wine runs out and his mother says to him, notice she is never named. His mother says to him, they're out of wine. And he says, ah. And she says, do whatever he tells you. That's the last we hear of her until chapter 18. Jesus said to her, What's it to you and to me? My hour has not come. She says, eh, do it anyway. She shows up again in chapter 18 when his hour has come. Because in chapter 18, she's at the foot of the cross, and Jesus says to her, Woman, behold your son. Man, behold your mother. Jesus connects 
this experience of joy, we connect this experience of joyful celebration at this wedding where his mother showed up and his mother challenged him to do something to continue that joy for that community and the experience of the cross. So we know that even in the great times, Jesus had in mind his hour. And everything that he did was in mind of where God was calling him. So likewise, everything that we do all the time has in mind where God is calling us. And because we know where God is calling us, we can walk through everything we have to deal with filled with joy. Because we know that no challenge that we meet is the last word. Because God always has the last word. And God's last word for all of us is life. We can be a part of that joyful community. Can you imagine what it would be like if, if when people were interviewed about Christian faith or about their religious affiliation, instead of talking about all of the ways that Christians fight with each other or everything Christians are against or all the ways that you can sin and be blackballed from the church, wouldn't it be great if people said, oh my gosh, have you ever been to one of their services? Have you ever been to some place where they're knitting prayer shawls? And the kind of joy that they express when they're doing the work they believe God has called them to do? We wouldn't have room in the church for everybody that would come if that was the kind of message that we had. Our calling this Advent is to remember that message, to remember Jesus' hour, to remember the community of abundant joy he was trying to build, and to be that in our world today. Amen.